apples and you open up an apple, in the middle of that apple, there are seeds. And, and you can count the seeds. Sometimes there's two seeds. Sometimes there's three seeds. If you get real blessed, there's four seeds. But you can count the seeds in an apple. But when you plant that seed, you really can't count the apples in the seed. Because a seed presents immeasurable and unlimited possibilities. I want to make a prophetic declaration over you. And I want you to take it personal this year. Who's ready for a word? I want to make a prophetic declaration over you. I believe that by the end of 2023, you are going to finish with more than you started with. You're going to finish with more. Someone say more. You're going to have more revival. You're going to have more power. You're going to see people get saved. You're going to have more finances. Come on, somebody. We have tasted of bitter seasons, but I want you to know it's time to become baptized in the blessings of God. We've been baptized in water. We've been baptized in fire, but I don't know who I came to talk to this morning, but I'm ready to get baptized into some blessings. Your season of blessing is here. Your season of blessing is on its way. I want to talk to some of you that you've been weeping in private. Get ready to rejoice in public. I want to talk to you that have been sowing and plowing in private. You've been in the prayer closet. Well, get ready for some public release. Get ready for some public breakthrough. Get ready for some public miracles. Get ready for your story to be told because weeping may endure for a night. But I came to tell you joy comes in the morning time. I want to talk to you, some of you that have, you've been spending time on your face. Get ready to start doing some great things on your feet. This is your season. I wish you'd get more excited about it. I wish you'd put your hand on your heart and you would prophesy to yourself and say, my season of defeat has come to an end. Uh, this is my season of victory. This is my season of breakthrough. This is my season for miracles. Come on, somebody. I'm going to reap what I have sown. And the word that I have for you is blessing. And I want you to say it like you got it. Say blessing. blessing. No, say it bigger than that. Say blessing. Blessing is your word. The word blessing means God's favor and protection. And this is the word that the Lord spoke himself over his people. This is the word of the Lord to his people. He spoke over his people because he understood that if they were going to do what he wanted them to do, they had to experience the blessing first. How many know God has called us to do some big things? But God can't do big things through bankrupt people. God says, before you can do it, I got to bless you. Come on, somebody. When he pulled them out of Egypt, he told them, take all the silver and take all the gold with you. Because <laughs> I got some big plans for you. I'm going to use you in a mighty way. I hope that encourages you, man. I hope that encourages you to know that this is a year where the Lord is going to use you in a mighty way. Bless. He told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, he says, I will make you a great nation. He says, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. People are going to know your name. You're going to be so blessed. People are going to know your name. He says, I'm going to make your name great, and this is the part. He says, and you shall be a blessing. You. And I'll tell you, there was a time when they didn't call us a blessing. They might have called us a whole lot of other things, but a blessing wasn't something they said about us. But today in 2023, the Lord has turned us into a blessing. He brought these things to pass for the children of Israel. When King David exclaimed in the book of Psalms 105, verse 24, it says he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than the enemy. And what David was speaking about is how the people of God became strong. Watch this. Not even in the promised land. They became strong in Egypt. They became too strong for Pharaoh. They became too strong for their enemies. I don't know who I came to talk to this morning, but the devil can't hold you back from what God is about to do in your life. But then he gives his people a warning. And how many know there's always conditions to the promise? 
you know, he gives them a warning in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11, because the Lord swears to bless them. He swore it to them. Someone say, he swore it to me. He swore to bring them into a good land. He swore to prosper them. And he tells them in, 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 in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11, he says, beware that you do not forget the Lord. Look at your and tell them, don't forget the Lord. Come on, look at your second choice. Tell them, don't forget the Lord. He warns him, he says, don't forget the Lord lest, look at this, this is powerful. He says, don't forget the Lord lest when you have eaten and are full. And have built beautiful homes and dwell in them. And when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold are multiplied, look at this, and that all you have is multiplied. Someone say, I'm blessed. And I like this part. He says, when your heart is lifted. Because how many know when the Lord blesses you, your heart is lifted? He says, do not forget the Lord your God. He says, you shall remember the Lord your God. <laughs> this, is, this is it. He says, for it was the Lord your God who gives you the power to get wealth. How many of you here could say, I'm blessed because of Jesus? And even in the New Testament, the Lord continues with this word to us. And this is a word I'm holding on to for my life. I hope you'll hold on to these words for yourself. He continues with his blessing even to the days we are in and to the modern church. In 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, John says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. In other words, you're going to, be, you're going to prosper in everything. Just tell your neighbor, we're going to prosper in everything. We're, we're going to prosper in our money. We're going to prosper in our health. How many know health is wealth? Come on, somebody. How many know health is wealth? We're going to prosper in our money. We're going to prosper in our health. And our soul is going to prosper. We're not going to be depressed. We're not going to be defeated. We're not going to be in conflict. Come on, I'm going to wait on you. We're not going to be split in two by the devil's schemes. Come on, somebody. We're not going to be tripping in our mind no more. Our soul, our body, our... I, I, I thought I had a church this morning. Our soul, our body, everything about us is going to prosper. I'm going to keep on saying it to you shout. Everything about us is going to prosper. Our marriages are going to prosper. Our children are going to prosper. Our bodies are going to prosper. Our businesses are going to prosper. This is my year. I don't know about you this is my year I'm about to be 50 years old y'all this is my year this is my year we're gonna prosper see there's no shame in prospering the Bible says he delights in the prosperity of his servants so you find right away that God's will is that what that we might prosper that we might increase but that we might also be a blessing and I want to tell you, I want you to put a pin on this. The size of your harvest will be determined by the size of your seed. Because he made his church. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Right? But how many know we got to preach the whole word? We don't just preach the New Testament. We preach the whole word. And he tells Abraham, he says, I'm going to bless you and you're going to be a blessing. He built his church that not only that the gates of hell would not prevail against it, but he built his church that we would get outside these four walls. Come on. That we would get outside these four walls and we would take what the Lord has given us and we would be a blessing to many people. We would, how many could clap on that? We, we got to be a blessing. We're a blessing. I got to thinking about how the church is a blessing, and, and I wrote three things down. Write this down. The first thing is that the Lord made us to be a blessing to people. Come on, somebody. If, if, you're, not, if you're winning and nobody else is winning, then what good is it? We, we got to spread the love. Tell your neighbor, spread the love. And when I think about blessing people, I can't help but to think about our church. I can't think about how God has called us to be used to bless our church. Because I believe great things happen here every time we get together. 
The Bible says where two or three are gathered, he says, there I am in the midst. The Bible says if two would touch and agree on anything, he said, I would do it. How many know we're better together? Come on, we're better together. The Bible says, do not forsake the assemblies of yourself. In other words, I, I think we got to be in church every week. And, and you ought to get loud because you were in the bar every week. Oh, you, oh, you want to act? Can I get, can I say, you, <laughs> hello, you were in the club every week. You can't come to the house of God every week. Come on, something's happening in this place where people are being blessed. One, one company said, one business company said, amazing happens here. Amazing things happen here. This is where amazing happens. And, and last year, I don't know if you know this, but last year in 2022, we had 41,600 people walk through these doors. That's a lot of people. 41,600 people walked through these doors. And 41,600 people sat in those chairs. Now, unless you're here every week and you sit in the same chair, someone else probably sat in that chair too last year. And I want them to bring out the chair. Something happens in that chair. See, see, don't underestimate how we're a blessing. If you could put it right there. Right there's good. You don't, have, don't underestimate how we're a blessing because every time someone sits in this chair, <laughs> amazing happens. <laughs> It's like a spiritual electric chair. People come in kind of nervous, and then they're like, oh, my God. And they sit down. This is something happens in their life. Things happen in that chair. Tell your neighbor, things happen in that chair. Things happen in that chair. This is where amazing happens. You know what happens in that chair? Decisions are made for God in this chair. Come on. Every time someone says, how many know wherever the word of God is preached, there's a demand for a decision? Come on now. Every time somebody sits down in this chair, whether it's on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night or a youth service, uh, there, there's a decision that's demanded wherever the word of God is preached. People make choices in these chairs. Oh, my God. They make choices about their life. They make choices about their destiny. Come on. There, there's a choice to serve the Lord. When people sit in these chairs, they make choices about their marriage. Come on, somebody. Because it's by choice and not chance that destiny is determined. Don't underestimate every time we get together and sit in these chairs. Let me tell you, this is not just a church service. We don't get together just to have church and to play church. Every time we come together is to overthrow the powers of the enemy. Every time somebody sits in that chair, we're believing that the devil will be defeated in their life. I'm going to wait on you. We're believing for spiritual breakthrough. We're believing for salvation. Come on, somebody. Don't underestimate that chair. Don't underestimate that chair. How many think this is a pretty chair? I thank God for those red chairs. We, we've seen God do some great things in those red chairs. We've had some good services in those red chairs. We had revival break out in those red chairs. And those red chairs are real oily. But they're also real old. So this chair I'm pointing at, these are the, our new chairs that we're bringing into the sanctuary within just a matter of a couple weeks. Come on, we're going to have some new chairs. But I don't want to just have new chairs. I want new decisions. Oh, come on, somebody. I don't want just new chairs. I want some new miracles. I don't just want new chairs. I want some new breakthroughs. <laughs> I want some new blessings. I want some new. Come on, who can get excited about a God that's able to do a new thing? Come on. You got to find your chair. Decisions are made for God in these chairs. You know what else happens in these chairs? Dreams are awakened in these chairs. People who have lost their dream and lost their vision and they've fallen asleep in life. The minute they sit down and in this chair and they get into the atmosphere of revival and they get into the atmosphere of prayer and the word of God and the prophetic word is preached to their life, something begins to wake up in their spirit and they begin to realize that they are made for more, that they are a giant killer, that they are a champ. I'm preaching to somebody. They are a champion in the things of God. 
dreams are awakened. How many of you had your dream awakened when you sat in the chair and God began to speak to you and he began to wake you up and begin to let you know that he had a big plan for your life? Dreams are awakened, and destinies are shaped. Destinies are shaped in this chair. Every time someone sits in this chair, man, whoo, this is good. I'm getting my, I'm preaching myself happy. This is good. Every time someone gets in this chair, there's times where this chair wakes up your dream, but then there's times where this chair makes you feel a little uncomfortable. That's why we got a double soft one. This one's softer than the one you're sitting. This is double padding on the back because there's going to be moments in your walk with God where you're going to sit in this chair and you're going to get discipled. And God's going to cut some stuff off of your life. And he's going to challenge you in ways that you, they don't challenge you at work like that. They don't challenge you in school like that. But when you get in that chair, the word of God begins to change. He said, I want to change some things. I want to break some things off of you. I want to take you to another level. There's power in that chair. There's power in the house of God. Decisions are made and dreams are awakened and destinies are shaped in the house of God. So the first way we're blessing is we're blessing to people. Somebody say people. The second way we're blessing is we're blessing to the ministry. Have you noticed that what God is doing here in our church has gotten outside these four walls? That when revival broke out, that so many people started to experience open heaven. That it's almost like the Holy Spirit gave people permission to renew their hunger. There's people all over Victory Outreach that have renewed their hunger for prayer. The ancient pathways of prayer and fasting. The ancient path, all the idols have been torn down. Can I hear an Amen. And we're seeing how revival is being released. Say, neighbor, revival is breaking out. And I thank God for this church that not only provides direction for people, but even provides direction for ministries that are in need of direction. See, God has given us a vision, but he's also given us not only a vision to reach the world, he's given us a vision to lead. A vision to lead, a vision to lead people to victory. God has raised us up for such a time as this. He's, he, he gets you in the chair, he begins to fill you, and then he begins to raise you up. He's using us to provide leadership. He's using us to provide vision. He's using us to provide care. He's using us to provide advice and direction to other churches and other pastors. He's, he's using us to show innovation to be innovative in our worship, to be innovative in our ministry. Come on, somebody. How I many know oh, this is an innovative church? We're not, we're not a dead church. We're not an ancient church. We, even though we've been around almost 40 years, come on, we're more innovative and more cutting edge than we've ever been. And I, and I kind of feel like the blessing is not just to the people, but God is using us to be a blessing to pastors. I know what it is to be a pastor and sometimes feel stuck. I know what it is to be a leader and sometimes feel stuck and just feel like, man, where's God moving? Where's God doing something new? Where is God speaking loudly? Where is God releasing miracles? And, and I thank God that many pastors have called me and they said, man, Pastor, I'll thank you for never giving up. Thank you for never throwing in the towel. Thank you and Sister Georgina that when all hell broke loose in your life, you stood preaching. You stood praying. You stood fighting. Come on, somebody. And, and, and what they tell me often is they say, because you stuck it out and you did not throw in the towel, when we're stuck, we have a place to look. When we feel like giving up, we have a place to look. When we feel like the harvest is not coming in, we just turn on the Victory Outreach San Diego YouTube and say, God, if you can do it for them, then you can do it in our city. Come on, somebody. God is using us to be a blessing. And lastly, not only are we are a blessing to the ministry, but we are a blessing to our city. That's what the church ought to be. I, I want you to know that each and every one of us that are here this morning, un understand we don't just come to church to play church. We're building a legacy. We're building a legacy in our city. And you know what our city needs? Our, our city needs a move of God. Have you noticed? 
Our city needs, who loves your city? Who loves your city? America's finest city. Even those of you that have moved here, transplanted here, you've fallen in love with this city. Because this is a great city. San Diego is a great city. How many can say amen? amen? It's a global city. It's a powerful city. And our city needs a move of God. And in order to have a move of God, our, our city needs a model. It needs a model. I, I kind of think our city needs a monument. And, and I don't want to say a monument in a sense of a statue or a museum, but something to look to. When you go to some of the great cities of America, such as Washington, D.C., or you go to New York City, or you go to various places, Mount Rushmore in, in, the, in the Dakotas, or you go to different places, there are these monuments that speak of the history. Come on. They speak of the greatness of our country. They speak of wars that have been won. They speak of battles that have, that have been won. They speak of people that have ro- risen above the ashes. Come on, somebody. They speak of people that have made history. Come on. I don't know about you, man, but my life was nothing. I, I would have been forgotten. If it had not been for the Lord, I would not be where I'm at today. Come on, somebody. I, I was supposed to be dead. I was supposed to be in prison. But guess what? The Lord is using each and every one of us to make history. And one day they're going to know your name. They're going to know what God did in your Your children are going to rise up and call you blessed. And they're going to say, if it had not been for the Lord, my parents would not be saved. My parents would not be changed. We would not be as blessed as we are. I think you ought to take a moment and praise him right now. Because the city is crying out for our people. The city is crying out for people. They're saying, where are God's people? And I want to tell you, God does have a people. Look at your neighbor and tell them, God does have a people. That's right. He's got a good-looking people. He's got a Mexican people. He's got a white people. He's got a black people. He's got an Asian people. Guess what? You are those people that God has raised up for such a time as this. He's got a spirit-filled people. He's got a people with a vision. He's got a people with a fire. He's got a people with a passion. Our city says, where are the people? Where are the people of breakthrough? Where are the people of miracles? Come on, somebody. Where are the people that have overcome the odds? Where are the people that they counted out but God counted them in? And we say, come on over to 4235 National Avenue because it's there where God's people are rising. God has a people. God has a people. And I'll tell you, we're building something here that's going to outlive us. Are you hearing me? We're building something that's going to outlive us. It's going to outlive me. Our ministry is almost 60 years old. One day, Victor Average will be 100 years old. It will be 100 years old because there's a third wave rising up in our ministry. There's a third wave. There's a new generation rising up that has been answering the call of God. Our, Our ministry will see 100 years old. That means this church will one day be 100 years old. I probably won't be the pastor. Come on, somebody. I'm putting in work now. But I'm not putting work in for myself. I'm putting work in for this next generation to begin to take their place. I'm saying, Lord, I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to lay down everything I got so that this legacy can live on in our city. They may never remember my name, but they'll always see a church. Come on, somebody. They will always see a church. A hundred years from now, Victor Arch San Diego will still be here. We're building a legacy because the city needs a move of God. And guess what the beautiful part is as they come to the keyboard? God is using us. God is using us. He's using us to build that legacy. He's using us to build that monument for his glory. That every time people see that Victor Outreach sign, they're going to know that that is the house of miracles. That is the house of miracles. That is the place where miracles happen. That is the place where if you're addicted, you could be set free by the power of God. 
That is the place where you, if you've been rejected, you can be accepted into the house. Come on, somebody. Come on, get grateful right now. How many can just be grateful? That's a place where if you feel like no one believes in you, it's there that God, you could find your call and you could find your purpose. See, God has raised us up to be a blessing, a blessing to people, a blessing to the ministry, and a blessing to our city. But I want to tell you this, is that we, we're believing God right now to do even bigger things. How many would love to see God do bigger things? Bigger things. I, I've never felt in my spirit so strong than in these last few months that this is our season to really give it all we got. To give it all we got. I don't know why. I feel a stirring in my heart to give it all we got. Look at someone and tell them, let's give it all we got. Let, let's, let's give it all to the Lord. Let's give our best energy, our best seed. Let, let, there's seed in this room. There's seed in this room. And I've just come to a point in my life where I said, God, I'm going to give you, give it all to you and live on the leftovers. I've learned that the leftovers are enough for a great life. I mean, seriously. I mean, they're enough for a great life. Most of the stuff I got, I don't even need. Can I hear an amen? God has been good to me. God has been good to you. And I want to tell you that whatever you've reaped in the past, hear me. I want to just speak to you soberly. This is what I feel God's doing in the spirit. Whatever you've reaped in the past is in the past. God wants to set up a new harvest for you. Who says, I'd like a fresh harvest? He wants to set up a new harvest. Somebody say new harvest. We're believing for a new harvest of souls. But you know what I'm also believing for you? A new harvest of finances. I am believing that. I'm believing some of you are going to be out of debt. You're going to get out of debt. There's going to be some things that the enemy planned against you that are going to actually fail. Because God's plans for you are so big. But he's waiting for somebody who will plant their seed and believe God for a new harvest. There's some of you right now that you're tired of what you're reaping. You say, man, I, 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 it's just been one bad thing after another. You're tired of what you're reaping. Let me tell you, if you're tired of what you're reaping, start changing what you're sowing. Come on, sow with a spirit of expectation. Come on, sow with expectation. What are you believing God for this year? What are you believing God to do? I'm believing for a harvest. I think if your pastor's believing for a harvest, you should be believing for a harvest too. That's what I'm going to talk to you about all year. Harvest, harvest, harvest. Seed, seed, seed. Harvest, seed. Harvest, seed. Come on, clap. Harvest, seed. Harvest, seed. See, your seed will determine your harvest. How many of you need some friends? New friends. Wave at me. Come on, you need... Say, oh, yeah, Pastor, I need some new friends. Well, hospitality is a seed for friendship. Be nice. That's a seed. Buy someone a Starbucks. That's a seed. Come on, somebody. Say, maybe if you bought more people Starbucks, you'd have more friends. Hospitality is a seed for friendship. Mercy. How many need some rec reconciliation in your life? How many need some healing in your relationships? Come on, somebody. Wave at me. Well, mercy is the seed for reconciliation. Plant that seed of mercy. Drop the charges. Let it go. Give it to God. And say, God, heal my relationships. Heal my marriage. Come on, heal my relationships with my children. How many want to see some progress in your life? Leadership is the seed for progress. Nothing moves forward until a leader takes his place. How many want to see some destiny released? Prophecy is the seed for destiny. Begin to open your heart to prophecy. Begin to prophesy over your loved ones. Prophesy over your people. My daughter called me from the UTC last week and says, Dad, I got to talk to you. She called. It wasn't even her call day. She goes, I got to call. I got to speak with you. I got to something happen. Something happened. I said, are you Okay. And she goes, no, I'm fine. But somebody prophesied over me. And I said, okay, who is this prophet? I 
said, you got to test every spirit. Is he credible? But she was so excited. She says, I feel it's a word from the Lord. And this is the word, Dad. And I said, you know, baby girl, that, that's a word from the Lord. But test it. Read the Bible. If it's not in the scripture, then it's not God. Can I hear an amen? amen. Prophecy is the seed that releases destiny. I, I feel like destiny is about to be released in this church. I feel like there's a fresh destiny. Who believes that? Someone say destiny. Miracles are the seed for salvation. Who's believing for salvation? Do you notice that before many of the people got saved under Jesus, they were first healed? That means you don't need to be saved to be healed. Come on, somebody. Jesus used miracles so that people would turn their life over to God. The greatest miracle is the salvation of the soul. But God will use a healing in your body to get somebody saved, to change a household. Come on, somebody. You ought to get them to church tonight. You ought to get them to the house of the Lord, but they're not saved. Don't worry about it. If they get their miracle, they will be saved because they know it's only God that was able to heal them. Woo. New season. Who's believing God for a new season? Prayer. There's no see new season without prayer. Prayer is the seed for new seasons. You want to step into a new season, you got to plow. If your ground has become hard and the dirt has become hard, you better pick up the shovel again. You better plow again. You better, better get back in that prayer closet. Come on. You better fast. We're fasting on Thursday. You better fast on Thursday. Come on. You better say, I got I to gotta start shoveling again. Hey, talk to me. I've gotten a little dry. Prayer is your seed for your new season. You notice every... Every harvest has a particular seed. Every harvest has a particular seed. Tell your neighbor, every harvest has a particular seed. You don't plant an orange seed and expect a watermelon. Are you hearing me? I just shared with you the type of seeds that produce the types of harvest. But what is the harvest I'm believing for for you? I'm believing for financial harvest. How many of you this year God's going to bring in a financial harvest for your life? See, you got to believe it. Who believes it? Do you believe that God is able to bless you financially? Do you believe that he delights in the prosperity of his people? Then understand, if you're going to get that financial harvest, you've got to plant the financial seed. You've got to do it. No matter what it is, I believe the size of your seed will determine the size of your harvest. And that's what we've been doing. We've been challenging our people. We've been challenging you. And I'm going to challenge you today because we're going to raise money right now. We're going to raise money for these chairs. How many think these are beautiful chairs? Can you bring out the carpet, one of the carpets? We're also going to be raising money for a new carpet. We're going to carpet this whole sanctuary carpet. New carpet. Amen. Praise God. So you can kneel down and pray because some of y'all need to plow. And you're going to have soft chairs and soft carpets so you could really plow all night long. We're going to fix up the sanctuary. We're going to get new sound. We're going to get the top sound system. You say this sound is good. Oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. We're taking this, whole, this church to a whole nother level. Come on. We're going to finish up the quad. We're getting all new furniture. We're getting a new coffee machine. We're going to build, listen to me, we're going to build a home for the harvest. We're going to build a home for the harvest. How many of the harvest of souls is coming? And here's what I want. Here's what I want. I want that when the new people come, they, they come in and they're blown away. <laughs> come on now. I want them to be so blessed that when they sit in this chair, they never want to get up. They're like, this is, it is good to be here. Let's build three tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Jesus, one for us. It's good to be here. Someone say it's good to be here. We're going to fix the restrooms in our children's. We're going to build up our children's department. Amen. We're going to do our, redo our nursery. There's a baby boom in the church. Have you noticed? I got a call this morning for one of our leaders. He goes, Pastor, I'm not going to be there because my wife is about to deliver. She's about to deliver this morning. I 
Jesus. And amen, brother. Praise God. We're going to build up that nursery. We're going to make the house of God even more excellent. We're going to make it more excellent. And then, and then here's what we're going to also do. We, we've determined that within the next year or two, we're going to get a bigger building. We're going to believe God for a 2,000 seat auditorium. Come on, somebody. And we're going to shake the world because God has been too good to victory outreach. He's blessed us. With, with all boldness, wave at me if you've been blessed by God. Let me see you've been blessed. I see you've been blessed. I see God's blessed you. I see how God has increased you greatly. Be seated. And what I want to do is I want our ushers to take their place. And we're going to give this morning a pledge. And we're going to ask you to turn it in within the next 60 days. Here's what we want to do by Easter. Someone say by Easter. We want the building to be finished. We want the sanctuary to be finished. We want the cafe to be finished. And we pray, pray we can get the nursery finished too. You know, it's not easy. We don't have a lot of workers, so we got to make it happen. But if we have the resources, we can move faster. Remember this. Remember this. The vision of God moves at the speed of your generosity. If you're slow to give, we're slow to build. But if you give quickly, someone say quickly. If you give quickly, then we'll have the resources to do it quickly. And I thank God that we've been able to do everything quickly in this place, as quick as we can. But what we're believing for is for all this to be done by Easter. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We're raising $300,000 in the next 60 days. Now, we've already raised $140,000. If you've given, can you stand? If you gave a pledge, can you stand? Can you clap for those that have given a pledge? Come on. We raised $140,000 with 66 people. 66 people raised $140,000. That's amazing. 66 people. But we need another $100,000 that I want to raise this morning. And what I'm going to ask is I'm going to give you the same challenge that I gave them yesterday. Some of you could give $3,000 this morning. I've already paid half my pledge. You can give $3,000 this morning. Some you can give $2,000 this morning. Some you can give $1,000 this morning. Now, I know we're married couples, but I made a pledge of $3,000, and Georgina made her own pledge of $3,000 because she's got her own money hidden in a shoebox somewhere in San Diego. <laughs> Who has that shoebox money? Talk to me, ladies. You know what I'm talking about. And she's a generous woman of God. I love to give as well. We're the first to give always, so we're giving the top dollar. When we raised 10,000 pledges, we were the first to give. Whatever pledge we've ever given, we've always been the first to give. So we're not takers, we're givers. And because we've given, we've been blessed. And I'll tell you, there's no other way to explain it. I don't know how it works. I know what the Word of God says, right? Bring the whole tithe in the storehouse so that there might be food in my house. And that's the word of God. And we preach the word of God and we practice the word of God. But then sometimes we'll bring the offering to the altar. And then, you know, we have a prayer like we're going to do in a moment. I don't know how all that works. All I just know is it works. All I know is that when you do God's word, it works. And what God is challenging some of us to do this morning, especially some of us that are new, you might have never given an amount like that. You might be new to the church. You've never been challenged in this way. This is your moment to begin to move beyond your comfort zone and begin to move out of that, uh, in a sense, uh, space of familiarity and move into a place where God is able to do something special in your life. I don't know how it works. All I know is that when you step out by faith, God begins to honor it. God begins to honor it. And there's so many testimonies of people who've been blessed when they've been obedient to the challenge and obedient to the word of God. So what we're believing for is another $100,000 to come in on today. Someone say today. Someone say today. Now the money's not due today, but the pledge, the promise should be made today. If you can give it today, 
give it. And I like to do it fast. Let's just get it over with. Because the sooner I get in the ground, the sooner I can believe for the blessing. So I'm already believing for blessing. Amen. But some of you, I'd like you to step out to do 3,000. Some of you, I'd like to step out to do 2,000. Some of you, I'd like to step out to do 1,000. And some of you can do whatever the Lord has placed in your heart. Now, maybe somebody said, I can do more than 3,000. Amen. Praise God. I could do 500. Amen. Praise God. But the main thing is this. This is the main thing. We should all do something. Are you hearing me? Do it according to your measure of faith. And the only reason I throw out these numbers is because I know our people. I know where we're at. I know what we can afford. Amen. There was a time when we would take a pledge here in our church. And you know what the starting amount would be? The top amount, you know what it would be? $500. Okay, who could do $500? And people were like, hey, oh, Lord, Jesus, $500. <laughs> You know what's amazing is God always came through. As people stepped out to give and stretch themselves, God came through. And what we're seeing now is God has blessed us and he's taken us to another level. And for some of us, you used to do the $500 pledge. If I say do $3,000, you're like, oh, that's no problem, Pastor. That's easy. I won't even sweat it because that's how good God has been. Amen? But here's the main thing. Do something today. Amen. I think this is a good time for, uh, how were you saying before, Gina, for them to, to, to get, take ownership of the church. And that's what's beautiful. Wherever you have your seed, you have ownership. You do. What I want from you is I want you to care. That's what, what I want. You know, God has always been our provider. Always been our provider for this church. He, he provides. He provides people. He provides leadership. Because it's not really our church, it's his church. But what I look for is ownership. We have a tendency to have ownership where we give. Isn't it true? Like if you buy stocks. Who's ever bought a stock or a Bitcoin? Okay. So the minute you buy that Bitcoin, you get excited. The guy I have a Bitcoin, you don't have one. All right. And then what do you do when you're looking at that phone every day? Talk to me of what that Bitcoin is doing because you have ownership. What happens when you invest in the house of God? Now you care. Now you care what we're doing. Now you care. Hey, what did the pastor preach on that? I missed. What did he preach? Oh, praise God. You care. Hey, what songs are they sing? Ooh, that's a new song. I care. Hey, what, what are the youth doing? Hey, I care. Hey, what's happening to the children? I care. See, the main thing is I want you to care because if you care, you'll grow. You'll increase. You'll expand. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? Hear my heart. Hear my heart. 